Well, if you were alive on February 6, 1564, this very day, 458 years ago, and you lived in the city of Geneva, you would have likely been a witness to something of historical import. So let's imagine you're there. It's a Thursday, and on the main boulevard, you see a frail, uh, sickly, 54-year-old man being carried through the city streets on a chair by his friends. This man doesn't have the strength to walk, and so his friends are supporting him literally as well as emotionally so that he can discharge his duties. As the procession comes closer into view, you notice a little trickle of blood has come out of the sick man's mouth and down onto his long white beard. For that man, this marked the end of a 28-year journey. In 1536, he had arrived at the city-state of Geneva, intending to spend one night. But God had other plans. And so for the bulk of nearly three decades, this man gave his entire emotional, physical, and intellectual energy to the city of Geneva. Before he was done, this individual would leave us with lectures that his students transcribed, which for us has become the gold standard of biblical commentary. Just as highly valued were the sermons on the books of the Bible that he left us, everything from Genesis to the Gospels to Isaiah and everything in between. He would also leave us with the most widely circulated and influential systematic theology of the Christian faith. And although he didn't know it, his life and his work would have a huge ripple effect on the ensuing 450 years of Protestant Christianity. As you watch this man, you, like everyone else, are intuitively aware that whether he would like to admit it or not, his life is very likely near its end. You notice the crowds thicken as the procession gets closer to its destination, St. Pierre's Cathedral. Quietly and soberly, the men carry their friend in and help him up the stairs to the elevated wooden pulpit. With great pains and great courage, the man opens the Bible on the pulpit and begins to preach, resuming where he had left off several days before. As a church member and regular attender, you're well aware that this man's preaching ministry includes not just Sunday duties, but often up to half a dozen sermons preached throughout the week. As he begins to speak, you reflect on this man, this preacher, this pastor, your pastor, John Calvin. You think about his three decades of ministry, marked by a sequential exposition of the scriptures, laying the word open before you and your fellow Genevans, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, book by book, teaching you the whole counsel of God. Now that day, February 6, 1564, you witnessed the very last time your pastor, John Calvin, was able to preach. Three months later, he would enter his eternal reward after a lifetime and legacy of faithfulness. So here at Refuge, in our own humble way, we try to emulate Calvin's example. We go through books of the Bible when we preach because we know that all of God's word is suitable and powerful and necessary. Verses that are clear and easy to understand, we preach through them. Verses that are difficult and taxing on our minds and on our hearts, 
We preach through them. Sad verses, happy verses, tragic verses, terrifying verses, convicting verses. We preach through them. Why? Because the Word of God is infinitely more effective and transformative than even the best of non-scriptural wisdom. And the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to press applications on us that are as fresh as today's headlines and as intimate as your most personal concerns. There are many preachers out there, and I don't think I'm telling you anything that you don't know, who chase their tails. And they worry about coming up with new, exciting, cutting-edge material for sermons. And they do this because deep down, even if they dare not say it, they believe God's Word is not enough. It's not relevant enough. It's not relatable enough. We ought to have pity for preachers who believe such foolishness. The truth is, God's Word is enough. It is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, the author of Hebrews says. Amen? It was enough when Moses preached it in the wilderness. It was enough when Ezra preached it in Jerusalem. It was enough when Paul preached it in the Areopagus. It was enough when John preached it on Patmos. It was enough when Augustine preached it in Algeria. It was enough when Luther preached it in Wittenberg. And it was enough when Billy Graham preached it for 16 weeks straight in Madison Square Garden. And it's enough for us today at Refuge. Amen? Amen. So with that in mind, let's prepare our hearts for God to speak to us once again through his written revelation as we continue in Matthew. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you and your word this morning. You are king, you are risen, and you've sent your Holy Spirit to empower us, to enlighten our minds, and to give us an affection for you and your glory. So Lord, please be with me this morning. May your word go forth and bless all who hear it. Guard our hearts and minds, we pray in your name. Amen. If you would stand with me, please, for the reading of the word. We're going to be in Matthew 4 today, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Again, 
the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and angels came and began to serve him. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. So this temptation narrative is in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew and Luke do the heavy lifting. Mark's account is very brief by comparison. And I mentioned in my previous Matthew sermon that we want to pay close attention to exactly what the gospel authors are choosing to include in their gospels, uh, the order in which they place things, the emphasis that they place on things. Uh, The temptation account is no different. It falls in a different spot in Matthew and in Luke, comparatively in the chronology. And also, Luke puts that temple temptation last in in the three temptations, because Luke has an agenda that's very Jerusalem focused. Luke's gospel begins in Jerusalem. It's going to culminate in Jerusalem. So for Luke, Jerusalem is a pivot point, and he wants to highlight that by making that the third and final temptation. That's just an example of the differences that you're going to see that you want to have an eye as to why the gospel authors did that. Another thing we need to note at the outset here in this narrative is that this temptation was God-ordained. It didn't happen to Jesus. Both Matthew and Luke say clearly that Jesus was led by the Spirit, that's what our Bibles say, to go into the wilderness. And Mark uses even stronger language. He says he was driven by the Spirit to go into the wilderness. So be aware, this was a God-ordained event with a purpose. And also I wanted to have uh, clear in our minds that Satan was not on a fact-finding mission. You see twice in verse 3 and verse 6 that Satan says, if you are the son of God. Now, make no mistake. Satan knew and knows that Jesus Christ is the son of God. The second person of the Trinity. What he's attempting to do there is address Jesus in his humanity as the incarnate God-man and have him doubt whether he's the Son of God. That's what Satan's agenda is there. Satan knows, and you tell even his demons in the Gospels obviously know that Jesus is the Son of God. A lot can be said of Jesus' responses to Satan, but even if this is your first time going through this narrative, you shouldn't have trouble understanding at a basic level, the three points Jesus was driving home in these responses. First, the Word of God allows us to live. So, we can live physically with food, but the food of the Word of God allows us to live in an ultimate and eternal sense. It's in that same sense that Jesus warned us not to fear he who can kill the body but he who can kill the soul. Now, in our weakness and frailty, we tend to conflate those things. We don't fear, we switch them around. We don't fear who can kill the soul. We fear what can harm the body. But after 40 days of eating nothing, the God-man, Jesus Christ, says to Satan, in essence, I can live without food. The children of men can live without food. What we cannot live without is every syllable that comes from my holy, perfect, righteous Father. That we cannot live without. The second point that Jesus makes is that we are not to test God. Now, some English translations, especially older ones, are going to have tempt there. They're going to render that verb tempt. 
Test is probably the better translation for our modern ears and understanding. We see in our Bibles there are clearly situations in which God tells us to put his character and his goodness and his provision to the test, where he in fact tells us to do that. There are other parts of the Bible in which the testing of God has at its root rebelliousness and sinfulness. And that's what we're talking about here. And specifically, Jesus, in his response to Satan, is hearkening back to the rebellion of the children of Israel in the desert after their liberation from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus' third response, we have a sober lesson about the human heart. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, by the way, just saying your first parents, Adam and Eve, gets you written off by half the culture, right? But they are our first parents. The historicity of Adam is an important thing. Jesus thinks it's important. Paul thinks that it's important. So I'm going to be on Team Jesus and Team Paul, okay? When our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, that resulted in a cataclysm that forever wrecked the innocence and God-directed nature of the human heart. So as a result, by nature, you and I are not innocent. We're guilty. And our inclinations are not naturally God-directed, they're self-directed. So think of the human heart, and by heart I mean the seed of our will and emotions, not, not the organ inside your chest. Think of the human heart as a factory. Before the fall, the human heart produced an unceasing stream of thoughts and intentions and actions that were pleasing to God. What happened after the sin of our first parents is that thereafter, our heart factories underwent a downgrade and a retrofit, with the result that they are exquisitely and efficiently and with great excellence able to manufacture idols all day, every day. And this is not just a non-Christian problem. Of course we know that non-Christians can rightly be described as idolaters because Christ is not on the throne of their heart. But Christians are also quickly prone to displace Christ from his position of preeminence. When I ask you, what matters to you most? What is your instinctive response? Some answers can seem good. Some answers can seem even pious. My wife matters most to me. My children matter most to me. My church matters most to me. My health matters most to me. The plight of the poor matters most to me. The beauty of music matters most to me. Any answer that is not Christ matters most to me is deficient. Any corner of your heart that you have reserved for preeminence to something or someone other than Christ is something you need to repent of. And we understand that if Christ is preeminent, then he will bring balance and goodness to all the other things that matter to you. You will have a right understanding of how your kids and your wife and your church should matter to you. But make no mistake, Christ needs to be on the throne of your heart. Not your spouse, not your family, not your church. It's Christ and Christ alone. And he isn't accepting Plan B or Plan C. It has to be him. And the scriptures repeatedly tell us Christ literally is a refiner's fire. And he's going to assist you in burning away that dross 
that draws you away from letting him be preeminent on the throne of your heart. So taking a step back now, what was the purpose of this temptation narrative? Why is it there in our Bibles? Now, if you think for a minute, you know that the, re- the way this got recorded is Jesus told it to his disciples, because Jesus is alone in the wilderness, right? So at some point, he told this to his disciples, and they wrote it down. But why is it there? We understand that Jesus passed. We understand that Jesus' answers are the best. We understand that Satan is the enemy of Christ and the enemy of our souls. But why is it there? I think the scriptures give us several clear answers. At the same time, I don't think we can exhaustively answer. And by that I mean this. There have been hundreds of thousands of pages written on, for example, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ that do not exhaust the meaning and import of what actually happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And I'm just talking about the stuff that's good and true, setting aside the stuff that's been written that's hocus pocus and false. So in the same way, I think there are some main and plain things about the temptation that Christ would want us as his followers to know. But the full depth and breadth of knowing what he experienced for 40 days in the wilderness, I don't know that we're going to be able to plumb that depth on this side of eternity. But God does call us to relentlessly pursue those things that we can understand. We quickly use that as an excuse, the the otherness of God. We sometimes use it as an excuse to sit down and watch TV instead. No, he calls us to pursue him as relentlessly as we can in his word. So I have two answers, and they're also in your bulletins if you'd like to fill in the notes. I have two answers that scripture makes clear regarding the why of Christ's temptation by Satan and his resulting victory over those temptations. The first reason for this event was to establish that Jesus Christ is the second and better Adam. The first reason for this event was to establish that Jesus Christ is the second and better Adam. So recall the circumstances in which both were tested. When Adam was tested, He was in the most lush and beautiful garden that ever existed. When Jesus was tested, he was in a barren wilderness. When Adam was tested, it was in an atmosphere of complete peace. When Jesus was tested, it was among, as Mark tells us, wild and dangerous animals. When Adam was tested, he had all imaginable food at his disposal except one. When Jesus was tested, he had no food. When Adam was tested, he had a companion. He wasn't alone. When Jesus was tested, he was alone. At Adam's critical point of temptation, he sinned. At Jesus' critical point of temptation, he succeeded and staved off the enemy. Adam plunged mankind into peril. Jesus, in his victory and subsequent death and resurrection, rescued mankind from that peril. Even in the aftermath to these experiences, we can't miss the intended parallel. After Adam's failure, what kept him from re-entering that garden? An angel. After Jesus' success... What comforted and nourished him? Angels. So we don't want to miss that the narrative of the temptation of Christ tells us in bold relief that Jesus is the second and better Adam and therefore eminently qualified to be our Redeemer. The second reason for this event was to establish that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets as a better Israel. 
The second reason for this event was to establish that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and the prophets as a better Israel. So when you're tempted, where do you go in the scriptures? Do you go maybe to the Psalms as a balm to your troubled soul? Maybe you go to Proverbs to gain wisdom. Perhaps you go to Paul's epistles for some practical advice on sanctification. Maybe you go to Revelation to be encouraged of how it all works out in the end. Those are all good places to go. But when Jesus was tempted uh, by Satan, he went to one book of the Bible every time, and that book is Deuteronomy. All of Jesus' response to Satan uh, come from Deuteronomy 6 through 8. When Moses penned those words in Deuteronomy, he was addressing them to the children of Israel at the end of their 40 years of rebellion before they were entering the land of Canaan. So again, the children of Israel were in the desert for 40 years and did not pass the test of obedience. So there's a reason Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and not 27 or 43 or 13. And we have to recall Elijah as well. Moses and Elijah are towering figures in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, they are mentioned 82 times and 29 times respectively. The Jewish readers and hearers of Matthew's gospel would have a deep respect and knowledge of and reverence for Moses and Elijah. So our Bibles tell us that Elijah, after being fed by an angel, on the strength of that single meal alone, walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. So, by the time we get to the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, where Moses, representing the law, and Elijah, representing the prophets, appear alongside Jesus, we already have clear indications from this temptation that this episode was to connect him back to Moses and Elijah, showing Christ to be the better, obedient Israel, as well as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So I think those are two things that are very clear from our text uh, that are uh, beyond dispute and hopefully helpful to you as you reflect on it. I want to spend some, uh, the rest of our time talking about some additional applications from our text today. So how do we appropriate, how do we use to our advantage what Christ has accomplished when we face temptation? Hopefully you now have a handle on what Christ did, but in light of that, what should we do? You remember, a proper study of the scriptures needs to always lead to right knowledge and right action. If your knowledge is off, that's not good. If your action is off, that's not good. Right belief, right action. I shared in the introduction that today, February 6, has an importance in the history of Protestant Christianity. This day also has an importance in the history of the Keller family. 29 years ago today, in the early morning hours, dozens of local and federal law enforcement officials converged on an apartment complex just west of Alderwood Mall. Every access point was covered by armed police, deputies, and federal agents. A half dozen officials approached the door of one of the apartments, and the designated point man knocked on it. A groggy and disheveled 27-year-old young man answered the door. The point man asked, are you Paul Keller? My brother Paul said, yes, I am. And those were the last words my brother spoke as a free man. Because he was immediately informed that there was a warrant for his arrest for multiple arson crimes. Later that morning, Paul confessed to setting 75 different fires 
over a six-month period. And he has been incarcerated ever since and stands to be incarcerated for the rest of his natural life unless the Lord mercifully intervenes. Just as I look to John Calvin as an example, I look to my dad as an example. My dad realized two weeks prior to Paul's arrest that his oldest son fit the FBI profile that the arson task force had published publicly as a calculated gamble in their desperation to apprehend the serial arsonist who had been plaguing Puget Sound. Shortly after the profile was published, as a family, we discovered tangible evidence that made it nearly impossible that the suspect could be anyone other than my brother. And so, my dad was tempted to sit on that information. He was tempted to not hand over information about his son to the arson task force. He was tempted to be quiet and sit in denial. But my dad has an allegiance to Christ that comes before even his allegiance to his family. And Jesus Christ demands that his followers be truth-tellers and seek justice and pursue holiness. So, my dad made the longest trip of his life, which was only a two-minute drive from his office to the task force headquarters at fire station number two in downtown Everett with his heart in his hands and hoping against hope that by some miracle he was wrong about Paul, he gave the task force the damning information we had discovered. Immediately, law enforcement drew a curtain down around the investigation and swore us all to secrecy as they began a flurry of investigative activity, including 24-hour surveillance of Paul that would culminate in his arrest on February 6, 1993. I had lunch a few weeks ago with a friend and brother in Christ. He also happens to be a good friend of my dad's and they used to serve together in ministry. This friend shared with me about a situation involving an area pastor. It wasn't gossip as what he was sharing was public knowledge. The pastor my friend was referring to, it's important to emphasize this, knows my dad, and he knows my dad's testimony very, very well. But tragically, this pastor decided to do the exact opposite of what my dad did when his own son got into legal trouble. This pastor was tempted to circle the wagons, tempted to deny, tempted to obfuscate, tempted to do everything he could to spare his son from appropriate accountability and justice. And not only was he tempted, but that is precisely what he did. He fell for every single one of those temptations. As a result, nearly all of that pastor's staff and elder board resigned in protest. The friend that I had lunch with was, in fact, one of the many who resigned. Two examples, two situations fraught with temptation. One man chose to honor Christ no matter the cost to him personally and his family. Another man chose to honor himself and his family over Christ. The Lord will honor my dad for his actions. The Lord knows the toll that took on my dad and the heavy price he paid. How was my dad able to undergo the excruciating temptation he experienced and come out victorious in Christ? Because between temptations, he was conforming his mind and heart to Christ. My dad's Christian walk leading up to the moment of trial in the crucible of testing, 
prepared him. This is the crucial listen, a lesson. This is what we so often miss. The work, the preparation happens in between temptations. We need to be continually in the word, in between temptations. We need to be praising God and praying to him in between temptations. We need to be loving our neighbor in between temptations. We need to be going to church, meeting and fellowshipping together in between temptations. We need to be asking for forgiveness quickly in between temptations. We need to be giving forgiveness to others quickly in between temptations. We need to be doing our secular work as unto Christ in between temptations. We need to be doing our school work as unto Christ in between temptations. We need to be beseeching God the Holy Spirit to sanctify us between temptations. My New Testament professor, Bill Cook, has perhaps the most helpful short distillation of this when he says the best way to prepare for and confront temptation is to know, believe, and obey the Word of God. Tiger Woods did not win his first green jacket at the Masters between Thursday, April 10, and Sunday, April 13, 1997 when he was tested on the unforgiving greens of Augusta National. What do you mean, Ben? Of course he won it. Yes, I realize he literally won it that weekend. What I mean is this. Tiger Woods won that green jacket in the hundreds of thousands of fairway drives, iron shots, short pitches, and clutch putts that he had practiced and performed before he arrived at Augusta National. What we do in between temptations is our part of the equation. But I offer hope today to those of us who have failed because there is another part of the equation. And that part of the equation is the tremendous gift of our Savior Jesus Christ and what he's done for us including this amazing promise. I will never leave you or abandon you. Now, either that's true or it's not. And I think it's true. During the run-up to Jesus' high priestly prayer in John's Gospel, hours before his arrest, Jesus promises the disciples and us that the Holy Spirit will come. And then Jesus utters this encouragement. I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. We see both sides of this equation in Jude's letter, where he says, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. That's our part. And he says in the introduction, to those who are the called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude is saying, keep yourselves, and at the same time, he starts by saying, you are kept. And he closes with his doxology that's been so precious to the saints down through the years, reminding us that our God is able to keep us from stumbling and to make us stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. Many of us have been tempted and failed. Sometimes it's a spectacular failure. Sometimes it's a very public failure. Sometimes I think the Lord called Peter as a disciple just for our benefit. Because the Lord knew at that critical hour, Peter would be tempted and he would fail. As many have observed, Acute temptation has a very sobering way of exposing who we are and where we're at right at that moment. And it showed Peter as a coward who would betray his beloved Lord three times, mere hours after telling Christ to his face, I don't care if I have to die, I will never leave you. 
we see ourselves in Peter, don't we? Or let me perhaps put it more strongly. We ought to see ourselves in Peter. But do you remember what Jesus told him? Peter, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. If you have turned from your sin and trusted in Christ as your Redeemer, He intercedes for you so that you will not fully and finally fail. We need to have such gratitude to our conquering Savior so that we can learn from our failings. And when temptation gets the better of us, may we cry out to Jesus for help and forgiveness so that like Peter, when we've turned back from temptation, we too will be able to strengthen our brothers. Amen? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we are prostrate before you this morning, full of the knowledge of your goodness and your love for us. Thank you that together, as your people, we get to celebrate what you've done for us. You know that as weak people, we need tangible physical reminders of what you've done for us. And so even as you were among the foolish disciples who you loved and were merciful to, even in their ignorance, even in their jockeying for positions in the kingdom, even in spite of their false promises and false bravado, you loved them. And you said, this is how I want you to remember me. Strengthen us, we pray. We know that temptations lie ahead of us. We know that the enemy is the father of lies. And we know that without your strength, we are bereft of hope. So, Father, strengthen us as we consider what you did in the wilderness, what you did on the cross, and most blessed of all, what you did on that first Easter morning. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.